we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and really zero in on verse 30 because, as I said, that is the whole focal point of the chapter, and I think it, uh, it reinforces the whole theme of the letter of 2 Corinthians, which I have called strength through weakness. It's a paradox. Nonetheless, it's true that the way that believers are strong spiritually is by recognizing their personal weakness. I'm weak morally, and I am weak spiritually. If I don't depend upon the Lord to infuse his strength into me, it's called grace, then I fall like everyone else. That's how it works. So strength through, and look at what he says in that 30th verse. Paul says, if I must needs glory or boast, if I'm going to boast, here's what I'm going to boast about. I will glory or I will boast of the things which concern mine infirmities. I will boast of my own weakness. That's the theme. And that's what he's saying. And so I've titled this message, What Believers Boast About. What Believers Boast About. We boast about our weakness. And I said this morning, as we looked at chapter 11, there's probably nowhere else where it is more evident that Paul wrote this letter because it's full of Pauline satire, sarcasm, irony. This chapter just exudes that. Paul simply tells it like it is. And why is he doing this? Because he is fiercely defending the work of God that God accomplished through him in the church that was planted, that was started in the city of Corinth, which was a very wicked city like New York. And so he figures this way. If these false prophets that have invaded the church in Corinth discredit him, they will also discredit the work of God that was accomplished in the starting and in the establishing and in the edification or building up of that church. And so that's why he's so fierce in his defense in this chapter. It sounds like he's just trying to build himself up. No, he's actually building himself down. <laughs> he's actually focusing on how inept he is, how unable he is, and how much he needs the Lord. And so that's the whole focus of Paul's boast. I am boasting in my personal inability so that you see that whatever has been accomplished here in Corinth is God's doing. It's not me. I'm not an orator. I don't have the rhetoric that you want to hear. And uh, I may not uh, be equal to the, the, the uh, brilliant intelligence of these super apostles who are really, remember, spiritual chameleons. They're false apostles. They're masquerading as the apostles of the Lord, but they're really not. And so he says, here's what I want you to understand about me, that my strength is the result of recognizing and admitting my own weakness. Folks, that is not just good for Paul and the church in Corinth 2,000 years ago. This is vital truth for Christian living here in New York City in this 2024. This is vital truth for any Christian in any period of uh, a church history. It's vital truth. And I remember how it, it so cemented in my thinking, this truth. When I was reading one time, long time ago, in Hebrews chapter 11, that great uh, hero's hall of faith, as it's called. And uh, you, you go from Abel, you know, to, uh, to Noah, Abraham, and on down the line, and down to Moses. And uh, finally, he says this, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, 
and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. He said, through faith, same thing, by faith, through faith, they subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the violence of fire, they escaped the edge of the sword. And here's the, the key line. Out of weakness were made strong. Out of weakness were made strong. That is the truth that you and I got to grasp onto and never forget and live out every day in our Christian life. I'm weak, but out of my weakness, when I admit it, when I acknowledge it, and when I latch on by faith to Jesus, I can be made spiritually, morally strong in the Lord. And so that's the truth that we want to communicate in this 30th verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Before we go any further, let's remember to pause and, and pray. Our Father, thank you for the scripture. Thank you for this particular one that we've already looked into this morning. But I know that we'll never be able to uh, reach all the depths of the wonderful truth that is in your word. In fact, we have to acknowledge that we're just scratching the surface. You always show us more and more as we return to these same passages and uh, meditate upon them. Your spirit enlightens us and we become illuminated with, uh, with truth that just uh, completely fills and permeates our hearts. And we're thankful for that. May this truth today, this simple principle, out of weakness, we're made strong. May that truth grip us and uh, may it really be something that we experience personally in our Christian lives in Jesus' name. Amen. So going back to that 30th verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I, I want to just share three main thoughts with you from that verse. And the first one is that this what he says in that verse is very revealing. It's very revealing because what he is doing is he is admitting that as a fallen human being in his life, he is weak and he always will be spiritually weak. He'll never be able to meet the standard that the Lord has set. That not only applies to Paul, that not only, not only applies to all believers, but it, it applies to all people, period. It applies to lost people. You know why lost people need to be saved? Because they're hopeless and helpless without Jesus. And uh, again, the same thing can apply to every human being. Paul is revealing something very important here. He's actually revealing that... Uh, Without Christ, no human being can ever produce anything that God wants. There is no human being that can measure up. In fact, Jesus himself says to his people, without me, you can do nothing. You can do absolutely nothing at all to please God in yourself. You're too weak. In fact, I mentioned this, I believe, in our men's breakfast when we were having a discussion yesterday, and I, I might bring it up here, where Paul is talking about a person without Jesus or a Christian who is not trusting Jesus, who's not depending upon him to live the Christian life. Here's what he says. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. For to be carnally minded, that is to live according to your self-effort. To be carnally minded is death. The carnal mind is enmity. That is, it's an enemy of God. It's in hostility. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Has it uh, ever dawned on you 
that the flesh in you, even though you are a believer, will never get better, will never change. In fact, God never saves your flesh. He tells us here that he does nothing with it. He leaves it alone. The flesh can't be subject to the law of God. Never. It's not the thing that he works with. And so would we depend upon self-effort to live the Christian life, we are bound to maybe look good for a little while in the eyes of human beings, but eventually we will fall flat on our spiritual face. Can't do it. And that's what Paul's revealing, that whatever God wants, I can't do it in myself. I'm too weak. I can't measure up. Flesh or self-effort will never get God's approval. God totally rejects any self-effort that we put forth to please him. It doesn't please him, okay? That's what he's revealing when he says, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in my weakness, in my infirmities. I can't produce anything that God wants in my own flesh with my own self-effort. What he's saying is, apart from Christ, I really don't have any spiritual worth. Without Jesus, you can't accomplish anything that is of any spiritual or eternal value. In fact, Jesus said this in John 6. He said, the spirit quickeneth, or the spirit gives life. He says, the flesh profiteth nothing. It's worthless. It's, it doesn't have anything of value to offer. Simply this, flesh can't do spirit. Okay? <laughs> Bottom line. Flesh can't do spirit. Your self, human self-effort will never be able to produce anything that is spiritual <laughs> and eternal. So that's what he's revealing in that verse. But there is also in 2 Corinthians 11, 30, not only a revealing, there is a boasting, right? He uses the word glory. Our, our version says glory. There is a boasting here. Uh, now, are you aware that believers are supposed to be boastful? Oh, well, I thought believers weren't supposed to boast. I thought we weren't supposed to be proud. Well, this is the right kind of boasting that he's talking about here. And the boast is, well, there, first of all, maybe I should say, let's talk a moment about the improper kind of boasting. That is, boasting of yourself. Uh, making your life all about you. And by living simply to please yourself. Uh, what comes to your mind and and what you want to do and and what you want to own and and uh, uh, where you want to be, you know, all of that becomes a part of the pride of life. And uh, people, whether they verbally or not, boast in those kinds of things. And it's all about making life what you want it to be. And pleasing yourself, and of course not the Lord. Of course, in, in a lost person's life, in a sinner's life, people who reject the Bible and reject the Lord in their life, they're just pursuing their own things, right? All they're interested in is what interests them, what they want. And they are living in total uh, rejection of and ignoring their maker what God wants from you, and the purpose that he has given you life. Sinners, they just ignore all of that. That's not important to them. And so it's all about their own existence. But we can point our fingers at lost people. But let's stop a moment and think about the way we live. Let's think about the way that we handle life. Believers making life largely about ourselves, 
is boasting in self, really, indirectly. Ignoring God's will for your life as an individual, that's boasting in yourself. Being lazy and doing, doing only as much as you want to do, that's self-boasting. That is maybe showy words that it focus on you, even in giving testimonies, that's boasting in self. I remember in a church that we attended, my family and I, in transition from the church that we started in Connecticut to the church that we started here in Brooklyn, I remember uh, the pastor, he would say, all right, uh, let's have some testimonies. And I want them to be ABC testimonies. And what's ABC testimony? He said, number one, they have to be audible. Number two, they have to be brief. And number three, they have to be Christ-centered, ABC testimonies. And uh, did you ever note how many times believers can't even give a testimony or pray without making it all about themselves? Now, I don't want to discourage <laughs> I don't want to discourage testimonies or even public prayer, but I want you to recognize that we can boast in ourselves even under the guise of spirituality, right? And so he talks about boasting. Proper, that's improper boasting. Proper boasting, what he's talking about here in the 30th verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, is really rooted in what he said in chapter 10 and verse 17 where he says, he that glorieth or boasts, let him glory or boast in the Lord. And that's a quote from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, where he says, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Don't let him glory in the wisdom of man. Don't let him glory in the power of man. Don't glory or boast in the riches of, of man, but rather he that, that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. And so that's what Paul is talking about in that 30th verse of chapter 11. It's rooted in a Christ-centered life that is all about Jesus and is not about you. It is a, uh, it's the, the boast of a person who is continually immersing his or her heart in the word of God because they want to know God, because they want to be more intimate with him, because they're seeking to be his follower and to follow him more obediently and share him successfully with others. That's the proper kind of boasting. That's what Paul's doing here when he says what he says. So look at verse 30 again. There's three things I said that I want to draw out of this verse regarding boasting, because it's there's a proper kind of boasting that believers ought to be involved in. Number one, I said his boasting is revealing. It reveals that he's weak. Number two, I said his boasting is, uh, is just that. It is boasting, it's glorying, but it's proper because it's not in himself, it's in the Lord. And the third thing here is what he says, uh, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. You know why he does that? He's going to build on this in the next chapter when he says in the uh, tenth, uh, the ninth verse of chapter 12, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory or boast in my infirmities. Why? In order that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay? So the third thing that we should draw from the fact that Paul says that we ought to reveal our weakness, our spiritual weakness, and not boast in ourselves, but boast in the Lord, is because when we admit our spiritual weakness, we put our feet on the path of spiritual strengthening. So there's strengthening, there's uh, re revealing, there is boasting, and thirdly, there's strengthening in this verse. Because while the grace of God 
is revealed to all humanity. That's what the Bible says. The grace of God that brings salvation, that rescues, appears to all human beings. While that's true, it's only beneficial to those who take advantage of it, to those who personally claim it, to those who receive it as a free gift. For instance, the unsaved. The Bible says Jesus, uh, uh, John says of Jesus, uh, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God or the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the power to become a child of God isn't automatic. It's only available through admitting that you are a hopeless and a helpless sinner in your lost condition. And by faith, you transfer your dependence from yourself to Jesus, who will exercise his power in your life, and he will completely save you, something you or no one else can ever do for you. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, free gift of God. It's not of works, he says, lest any man should boast. So there is a spiritual strengthening that comes as a result of claiming God's strength once you admit your weakness. And in the believer's life, it's just as important that we claim that strength. The strength that saves the lost is the same strength that empowers believers to live and serve Christ, to live a successful Christian life, a victorious, a holy life. Paul boasted to show how weak he was. And really, again, that is the bottom line principle of the Christian life and serving the Lord. You boast in your weakness. You reveal that you're completely unable to please God in your flesh so that you depend entirely on him. You don't rely on your self-effort because you recognize that I'm not sufficient for this. My sufficiency is in him. And that's exactly what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And that's what Paul meant when he said, I can do all things through Christ, who or which strengtheneth me, that I'm weak, but I can tap into and claim his strength in my weakness so that I can do what otherwise would be impossible to me. The power of God in your life is only available to you, listen to me, as you acknowledge your inability. It's only available as you admit your utter helplessness. And by faith, you depend upon the Lord to do for you what you can't do for yourself. In fact, I want to close our thoughts by going back to uh, the book of Isaiah. This is a, a famous verse, I understand, and a famous chapter. But in Isaiah uh, chapter 40 and verse 29, here's what the prophet says to Israel. He, that is God, he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, if you want God's power in your life, you have to come to recognize and admit to him that you have utterly no strength of your own, that you are completely strengthless. That's what verse 29 says. And then the famous verse, even the youths shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What's he doing there? You don't have any strength, but you can renew your strength. Get it? That's what Paul's talking about. This is the Old Testament equivalent. I'm weak. He's strong. I don't have any strength to please God and to do the will of God. He has all the strength that I need. And he will, that word renew means 
exchange. You can exchange your utter weakness, utter strengthlessness for his total strengthfulness, for his total power in your life. That's what he's talking about, to exchange your weakness for God's strength. That's Christian living. That's how we live and serve the Lord. 